Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you all today. My name is Kathleen Quo, and I am a program manager with Nevada Humanities. And on behalf of our organization, it's really my pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. So for those of you who don't know who we are, Nevada Humanities is our state's affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we try to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. Nevada Humanities is also the host for the Nevada Center for the Book, which is our state's affiliate of the Center for the Book housed at the Library of Congress. For this year's Library of Congress National Book Festival, we are thrilled to be featuring author Michael P. Branch and his book, On the Trail of the Jackalope, How a Legend Captured the World's Imagination and Helped Us Cure Cancer is our adult selection for the Great Places from Great Places reading list, alongside New York Times bestselling author Axie O's The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea as our YA selection. The National Book Festival is gonna take place this year in Washington, DC on September 3rd with the theme Books Bring Us Together. As a reminder, today's webinar is recorded and it will be shared on our Nevada Humanities website and YouTube channel once the video is ready. We would love to hear from all of our viewers today in the audience about your jackalope sightings, any questions you might have for our two experts, and we're going to set aside time as well at the end of this conversation. So please feel free to share your comments and questions in our chat for our presenters to see. So I couldn't be happier again to be introducing two jackalope and humor enthusiasts for you both or for all of you. Michael P. Branch is an award-winning humorist and writer of environmental creative nonfiction and foundation professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. He is the author of more than 300 essays and reviews and 10 books, including Raising Wild, Rants from the Hill, How to Cuss in Western, and On the Trail of the Jackalope. This creative nonfiction includes pieces recognized as notable essays in the Best American Essays, the Best Creative Nonfiction, Best American Science and Nature Writing, and the Best American Non-Required Readings. Um, and as we stated before, the Nevada Center for the Book is featuring On the Trail of Jackalope as our Nevada Great Reads from Great Places selection for the Library of Congress National Book Festival. And if you happen to be in the area, Mike will also be participating in the 2022 Nevada Humanities Literary Crawl on September 10th this year in Reno. We are joined today by Moira Marsh, who is a folklorist and humor scholar. She is the author of Practically Joking, published in 2015, which is the first book-length scholarly study of the practical joke and allied forms of humor. Moira has served on the executive board of the International Society for Humor Studies and on an editorial board of Humor, International Journal of Humor Research. In her spare time, she is a librarian for folklore at Indiana University of Bloomington, where she also cares for Boris, the fabulous flying jackalope. So Moira and Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And can't wait to learn more about jackalopes from you too. Thanks so much, you guys, for having us. And it's always so great to work with Nevada Humanities. We're so lucky to have such a great crew of people helping to get the arts and humanities out into our communities across the state. I always love working with Kathleen. Bridget is out there also, and thanks to her as well. And then special thanks to Moira Marsh for being with us. And I wanted to really double down on what Kathleen said. This uh, book right here called Practically Joking is the only book length study of the practical joke. And for a guy like me to have an opportunity to talk to the person who literally wrote the book on the practical joke is pretty fun. So this jackalope book that I've um, been sort of touring around, I'm in the middle of about a 50 event run. Uh, it's really rare for me to have an opportunity to talk with a folklorist. These are the people who really understand this stuff better than I ever will. So this is just a super treat for me to be talking with Moira. And Moira and I have agreed that this will be pretty conversational today. And hopefully you all have jackalope questions, jackalope sighting narratives you feel compelled to share. Feel free to type into the chat at any point. And after we've been in conversation for a half hour or so, uh, we'll segue into uh, having a little help from our Nevada Humanities buddies to help present to us some of the questions in the chat. And we'll, we'll both take them up as best we can. So thanks to everybody for being with us and Moira, I, I see Boris in the background. It's good to see both of you today. Well, thank you for that warm introduction and that uh, <clears throat> that warm welcome. Um, so uh, yes, I thought I would start just by uh, tackling the burning question by the horns and asking you, what is a jackalope? What is a jackalope? Well, I mean, I think when most of us think of a jackalope, we think of some kind of rabbit with some kinds of horns. It might be a cottontail, it might be a jackrabbit. 
It might have pronghorns like an antelope, or it might have branched antlers like a deer. But um, I think most of us think immediately of that cute little horned rabbit and immediately think too of all the people who have to ask themselves the question, hey, is that thing real? It sure looks real. Um, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, I don't believe I had encountered jackalopes until I came to this country. Um, I can't remember precisely when, um, but uh, when you start looking for them, my, my goodness, they are everywhere. That's right. And that, that's part of what got me so interested in this project, actually, was that, you know, I've always thought of the jackalope as sort of iconic in the American West. We see it in pool halls and greasy spoon diners. And we also see it on all this kitsch, right? You know, postcards and snow globes and oven mitts. And, you know, uh, I was in my local brew pub one day and I saw a woman lift a pint of IPA and on her arm, she had a jackalope tattoo. And that was the moment where I sort of said, this has gone far enough. Where did this thing come from? How did it get so widely disseminated in popular culture? And that was really the origin of my work on this book was to just try to do the work that I guess folklorists must do all the time, which is to choose some odd phenomenon and then dig and dig and dig to try to understand where it comes from and, and how it's disseminated. Now, you're from uh, New Zealand, is that right? Correct, yes. Now, do you have imaginary creatures in the, is there a sort of bestiary of New Zealand invented creatures? We, we, we almost uh, adopt the Australian drop bear, <laughs> you heard of the drop bear mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, an animal that resembles a koala in every respect, except that it's carnivorous and rather ferocious and it has a habit of dropping on people from high, high in the trees. And, and uh, the only way to keep a drop bear from getting you is to smear Vegemite under your armpits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that the drop bear stories, like the jackalope stories, are designed primarily for outsiders, right? This is this is something you want to share with tourists at your first opportunity. Exactly, um, and there are there are as folklorists know, and I may well be some folklorists among the uh, the audience here today. There are a gazillion of these uh, comic, legendary creatures in the folklores of the world, um, not just the United States, but absolutely everywhere. Um, and the jackalope is, is just one, but I think the jackalope is my favorite. Um, what, it's what, certainly the cutest. What, what do you think sets the jackalope apart from other invented animals that folklorists study? Why, why do you think, because I get asked this question a lot and I have you know, a variety of different answers to the question, but I'm still really struggling with it. That you know, as a folklorist, I'm sure you know that especially in the 19th century American West, there were many, many invented animals, most of which uh, we wouldn't even recognize the names of today. And yet here we have the jackalope, you know, almost a hundred years on. And there's no question that not only does it still exist in the popular imagination, but it's, it's gaining visibility every day. I see it in the names of bars and restaurants, clubs and teams. Uh, the kitsch is everywhere. Legitimate jackalope art and music is everywhere. So I keep asking myself throughout the book, but also since it was published, you know, what is it about this particular incarnation of an invented animal that seems to be so durable or so attractive. And, and uh, I, I get asked that a lot, but I don't get to ask it of other people very much. <laughs> I wonder if you have thoughts about that. Why, why do you have a, for example, why do you have a jackalope in your office instead of one of the many other options that a folklorist might feature? Well, um, I'll let me show you. Just introduce, this is Boris. The fabulous flying jackalope, as you can see, he has wings and a tail, as well as a fine set of antlers. Uh, and he followed me home from Wyoming, from Jackson Hall, um, some years ago. And he's lived here in my office in the Wells Library at Indiana University ever since. And we've adopted him pretty much as an unofficial mascot for my department of librarians, um, because he's by the far the cutest of us. Um, on the other hand, he is, uh, he's useless at reference questions, <laughs> but cuteness goes a long way. And I do think that is one part of the, of the appeal of the jackalope is that, I mean, look at it. It's furry, it's soft, um, and it's real. You can see it. And I think that having jackalopes are real things that you can see and touch and encounter. It helps keep the story alive and popular. I think that's really an important part of it. And since the advertisements for this event in, involve not only Boris, but also Paxton. 
Now Paxton looks a little more demonic. He's sort of he's less cute. Paxton looks like he he might gore Boris in the middle of the night. It's, it's got the, <laughs> but I'd like I, to see him try. Uh, <laughs> but I think you you know you've hit on something really important, and that is that. Uh, there are so many of these invented animals in popular culture. Folklorists have studied them for centuries, and their fame is carried forward through all these outrageous narratives. And there's a huge body of folk narratives that surround the jackalope, of course. And many of these stories, which I'd be happy to share some, are, are just hilarious and wonderful. But the difference, the difference is that when you tell somebody a jackalope tale and they say, nah, come on, there's no way, that can't be real, then you march them down to the pool hall or the diner or the VFW lodge and you say, here it is. How can you deny the existence of this thing? So I'm really interested in the way there's a kind of dialogue that takes place between artifact and narrative, between the thing itself and the stories that are told about it. And there's something about the fact that the hoax taxidermy mount is kind of at the, the fountainhead of all of these narratives that in some ways makes the jackalope a little bit different. Now, I will say there are analogs to the jackalope in other cultures around the world that have also then been backed up with hoax taxidermy mounts. So just as an example, your, your wing jackalope reminds me of the, the Bavarian Volpertinger in part mm -hmm. of Germany, right? It's basically a jackalope with wings. Um, but in the 18th and 19th century, enterprising taxidermists who had been telling Volpertinger stories for for you know, generations decided, oh, well, I, I know what it looks like. I have a description of it. I know things about it from these stories. I'll just go create one. But then once the taxidermy mounts were created, it gave all these storytellers something to hang those stories on. And so I, I think you're right that that relationship between the artifact and the narrative has been really important to keeping jackalopes alive. There are plenty of people who you know, would never want a taxidermy mount, but they've got the t-shirt and the keychain and the poster. And so I think that that, that, that is really different, isn't it? It is different and, it, and it's easy. I think it's easier to, to fabricate uh, a jackalope than it is some of the other sort of fictional animals. I mean, how would you fabricate a drop bear? Yeah. For, for instance, you'd have to yeah. kill a koala, which I, I don't think, I'd have to draw the line at that. Um, <laughs> Um, things like uh, the wild haggis of Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Haggises are, are ugly, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. um, creatures like the uh, the squonk or the uh, the dahu or the volpertinger or the wampum. What is one good? This is my favorite one. The wum wampu. <laughs> wampu hoofus. <laughs> wampu hoofus. Um, um, and the side hill gouger, which is bred to run around a steep hill, um, uh, and over generations has bred so that uh, uh, one side, one set of legs is shorter than the other, so it can only ever run in one direction. <laughs> there are left hand morphs and right hand morphs uh, of the side hill gouger, and the way you catch one is that you figure out which direction it's going in, and you stand in uh, the opposite, in the opposite direction, and um, you know. Uh, I'll make a loud noise and scare it. It tries to turn around and falls over. <laughs> but uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, and, and, but how do you how do you uh, uh, fabricate that and uh, make it make it material? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. And the side hill gouger is one of my favorites, also. And I love the way you told the story of it. I I think too. You know, another factor that it seems to me is important about the jackalope that applies to a lot of invented animals, but certainly not all, is this idea of hybridity, right? That it's made up of different things that seem vaguely recognizable. So that's what I love about the drop bear, right? You can begin by saying, well, it's like a koala, but it does this other thing. Uh, but many of these invented animals are created out of whole cloth. And so they're great material for storytellers, but they're hard to visualize. And I think, you know, one of the things that, is so compelling about the jackalope is that, especially the way it's typically rendered with deer antlers rather than um, for antelope uh, horns, is that everybody knows what a rabbit looks like and everybody knows what deer antlers look like. Iconically, these are relatively familiar. And I love the way something so alien and strange and wonderful is created simply by putting together two things that are fundamentally um, pretty familiar to us. So I think there's that too, that the jackalope for me, it, oh, whenever I look at one, I always have a feeling that 
it looks so familiar that it seems credible. It seems real. There's part of my brain that recognizes everything it sees. And yet there's another part of your brain that sees that and says, and yet something, something's wrong, something's magical, something's different. So I love that idea of the combination of the familiar and the alien, and the fact that there's something about hybridity. Uh, when you look at the folklore of you know, cultures, indigenous and otherwise, very often these animals are hybrid in some way. And I wonder if you have thoughts about that. Why, why do you think, what would a folklorist say about why so many of these animals seem, seem to be hybrid in this way? I think hybridity in and of itself is is fascinating, but it's also usually scary. Um, I'm thinking of uh, even in the ancient mythologies, classical Greek and Roman mythology, we have hybrid monsters, and they were considered monsters: hippogriffs, griffins, the the sphinx, which was uh, you know dedicated its life to trapping people with riddles and then eating them. Um, Pretty scary stuff, and a lot of the the other kinds of monsters. And there's a fine line between a legendary creature like a jackalope, which is comic, and a legendary creeper creature like a chupacabra, which is much more demonic uh, and dangerous and scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if there isn't something about the appeal of the jackalope that has to do with taming uh, the monstrous. I really like that idea. And, and in the book, I talk a lot about the importance of monsters to every world culture. There, there aren't that many things that every world culture seems to have in common. One of them is humor, right? We've never found a culture in the past or present, indigenous or otherwise, that doesn't have humor. You know, we marry differently, we eat differently, we bury our dead differently, but we all have humor. It turns out we all have monsters too. And I borrow this idea from uh, one of my favorite writers, the Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges, uses this term, the necessary monster. And I just love that idea, the necessary monster. He basically says, well, you know, why is it that every culture around the world has monsters in its folklore and mythology? It's not about them, it's about us. It tells us something about the human mind, about the human psychology and imagination that we need to be able to wonder what's beyond the edge of the world we already know how to describe. I, I love that idea of somehow taming the monstrous because it is true that you know, so many of these folkloric animals are terrifying. Chupacabra is a great example from, from North America. And you know, part of the reason, of course, that the jackalope is comic is that it seems like it's already satirizing something. And all you, need, all you need to really appreciate that, right, is to see a jackalope mount on a wall is always fun, right? It always makes you smile. But nothing is funnier than seeing a jackalope mount on a wall with a bunch of heads of big game animals. And you know, it puts it in a context where you immediately realize, okay, among other things, this thing is a joke on it, it, now we can make a list. Is it, you know, masculinity? Is it um, the need to display trophies? Is it our own human ego, right? But um, for example, at the Wyoming Pioneer Museum in Douglas, Wyoming, which is the little town in Wyoming where in the 1930s, these two teenage boys, Ralph and Doug Herrick, created the first ever jackalope hoax mount. And that town to this day is very proud of that. They consider themselves you know, they're all in on jackalopes. But when you go to the Pioneer Museum and you see, you know, the head of a bison that would have weighed over a thousand pounds and, you know, elk with six foot racks, and then there's the jackalope, you know, it, it the context really matters. And so I love that idea that, you know, it's a monster, but it's a tamed monster. And I think that may be one reason too, why people love to tell stories about jackalopes being vicious. Um, when people say, oh no, you know, that a cute little bunny. Oh yeah. Let me tell you about the time it gored my sister. Or let me tell you about, you know, in the 19th century, hunters used to wear lengths of stovepipe on their legs to keep their legs from being shredded when the jackalopes attacked them. And, you know, if you can keep a straight face long enough, the idea of sort of reminds me of Monty Python, right? The idea of this harmless bunny uh, being so vicious is really a part of the fun. That incongruity, as a humor theorist would put it, right? Um, yes. That difference between the innocence, the cuteness, and the idea that it might be vicious, you know, I think is all part of the fun. Very, very much so. I think of it, and you you hit on something there that uh, that uh, 
uh, one of the major human theories uh, extant today is that humor derives from um, some variation of either benign violation or, or appropriate incongruity. And incongruity is also frightening and monstrous, unless you can find a way to render it safe or um, appropriate. So um, if I encountered uh, a rabbit like that one, in, in reality, and this place is crawling with rabbits, but if I saw one that looked like that, it, it would be somewhat alarming, mm -hmm. or at least weird and strange. But I know that this guy is, I can safely laugh at it because I know it's entirely fabricated. Mm -hmm. So the incongruity is, is, uh, it's appropriate. It's, it's a spurious incongruity. Mm -hmm. um, it's that's, also kind of ironic, I think. That, that's right, that the two frames of reference don't fit together, but they don't fit together in a way that we recognize right away and that we enjoy. But I, I think you're right about incongruity also being terrifying. I mean, one of, one of the frames that I like to think of the jackalope in, and this is, again, me stepping into the realm of real folklorists like yourself, but you know, um, you think of the role of trickster figures in a lot of cultures, right? Their job is to move back and forth between the world of the known and the world of the unknown. They, they negotiate that liminal territory, that uncertain territory between what we're sure of when we wake up every morning and all that stuff we wonder about, does it exist? What's, what's happening in the world beyond the one we understand? And in many indigenous cultures, especially, there are narratives about often animals or hybrid animals that move back and forth, but they keep commerce open, I guess, is one way to put mm -hmm. it, or keep imaginative commerce open between the realm of the real and the certain and the realm of the possible or the imaginary. And, and that's terrifying, but it also has, I think, a kind of deep appeal to us because of our curiosity about what lies beyond the everyday world. I think, I think definitely so. It's a mixture of curiosity, but also, but also fear, fear and awe uh, at the same time. And tricksters are good, uh, uh, a good example of that. <clears throat> My, I say, I, I talk about tricksters somewhat in my book because I'm talking about practical jokers. Practical joking is one of the things tricksters are known for. We enjoy tricksters when they are safely in, in, encased in narrative, when they're, when they're in myth or on film or in cartoons and so forth. Um, but as I say in the book, you, you, you wouldn't want your daughter to marry one um, right. because they're both, they're both culture creators and culture just violators as well. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's some of that same ambiguity in one package that goes on there. And that's a big part of what, and people talk about humor, some of the philo philosophers of humor talk about how humor is a way for us to experience chaos, but do it from a safe, a safe distance. You know, that connection that you're making, Moira, between um, the trickster figure and, and the role of humor in culture, I find that really, really interesting because think of, you know, the the subject matter that we often engage in humor, it often has to do with the same kinds of things we're busy repressing, right? Sexuality, mortality, mm -hmm. the functions of the body. Uh, and there seems to be some sense in which the things that we know we're not really allowed to talk about, we can somehow get away with talking about if we do it in the form of a joke. And so, you know, even things that would be considered outright offensive in polite company, somehow if they're packaged in the context of that joke. And so I, I, I like the idea, you know, as a humor writer, I'm not a humor theorist, but I am a humor writer. My last three books were all humor books. And I, I like that idea that humor sort of, you know, sneaks across enemy lines somehow. Humor mm -hmm. figures out where culture has said, you may not go further than this and still be considered uh, a person worthy of respect. And humor somehow sneaks under that fence, gets over to the other side, detonates an idea, and then sneaks back again. So maybe the maybe the trickster figure and the joke have something in common in terms of boundary crossing. I, th I think I think you're exactly right, and this is where we cue Dr. Freud. Correct. <laughs> Freud's theory of humor was that humor, the joke work on the top, uh, is a cover to introduce um, disreputable material, a material that's normally culturally uh, banned or out of court or just, just not allowed. Um, but of course, the, the very fact that something is not allowed makes it irresistible. Yeah. Um, and humor gives us a way to sort of have our cake and eat it, if you like. 
Yeah, a, a lot of people don't know. I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, people think of Freud's work on the interpretation of dreams, but within just a couple of years of the publication of that book, he publishes this entire book about jokes and how jokes work. And so one of the theories of humor, as you know, is this idea that, you know, humor, um, you know, does sort of function in this, um, it, it allows us somehow to engage taboo material in the same way that, that Freud at least would argue that dreams do. Now, mm -hmm. um, I, I think the line of people ready to support Freud these days is pretty short, but I still think it's a very interesting, <laughs> interesting idea. I, I wanted to ask you another question. I know, I know we're supposed to be talking about the book to some degree, but this is, okay. this is really fun for me. I get asked a lot um, because, as you know, my book kind of makes the case that the jackalope can be used as a hoax and that to the degree it is used as a hoax, I make the argument that that's in a long tradition of hoaxing that goes back millennia and that the hoax generally, this is my take and I'm, I'm fixing to ask your view here in a sec, that the hoax is designed to produce pleasure and that it only works if it's revealed. And that in that sense, it's very different from a con where the perfect con, you would deprive somebody of their money or power or stuff and nobody would ever find out. That would be the perfect con. But in a hoax, it has to be revealed in order for it to be a community building tool and for pleasure to be created. But I, I get asked a lot, hey, in this political climate, uh, are you sure you want to be the guy who's out there endorsing the value of hoaxes? I mean, in an, in an era of conspiracy theories, doesn't it become more difficult for us to articulate our, our support of this? So because you wrote the book on practical jokes, I think the same kind of argument could be, could be made there. And I just wonder, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, you seem to think hoaxes and practical jokes are a good thing, a useful thing, a helpful thing. But, but look at our culture. Part of what's tearing us apart is um, that we believe stuff that isn't true. So as a folklorist, how, how do you approach that when you get versions of that question? That, that is the key question, isn't it? That, that is the crux of so many things. Uh, and I have had the same questions uh, about practical jokes slash hoaxes and the, the two realms overlap quite a bit. Um, as folklorists, we, we sometimes are guilty of um, um, being too celebratory. I mean, we love this stuff, right? So we collect it obsessively, we, we document it, we catalog it, we track it through time and time and place, um, we look at the creativity that goes into it and so forth, and we, we celebrate it. Um, but sometimes, and I'm guilty, I admit to being guilty of this myself sometimes, that uh, overlook that there's sometimes a dark side to this, to all of this great stuff. So there's a dark side to jokes. There is a dark side to practical jokes. And, but the dark side is part of the pleasure. Um, and so balancing those two things is, is the trick, uh, I think, for both for those of us who study this material and for those of us who simply appreciate it. And of course, for those of us who engage in it as, as, uh, uh, as artists, as creators, yeah, I think that's really helpful. I, I think of that too, that there, there is kind of a moment of darkness when people who understand the joke, whether it's a practical joke, a hoax, a jackalope, uh, sort of use that to fool somebody else. There, there's tension created there. And that tension isn't wholly um, beneficial, right? But I, I'm glad that you're willing to kind of defend that in a way, because that, it seems to me, is what builds the pressure that causes the release when the hoax is revealed to be so special. And when I think about jackalopes, uh, Moira, I think a lot about the jackalope hunt because so many of these imagined animals have hunts, right? The snipe hunt is a gag that's been going on in the US since before the Civil War. But I've talked to a lot of people who've said, oh yeah, you know, my granddad took me out on my first jackalope hunt and he marched me all over the place in the rain and he taught me all this stuff about how we were going to catch a jackalope and <clears throat> you know so a person sort of says I was fooled and it was kind of miserable in a way but here's what happened when it was revealed to me here's how fun it was here's how much I enjoyed it and then importantly and this is something I really try to emphasize the person who has been fooled then joins the community of people who will you know, give this gift to the next person. And 
you know, one of the really clear examples of this, we talked to happen to mention the Volpertinger, the kind of, you know, Bavarian analog of the jackalope. You know, I interviewed Bavarians about this and they said, oh yeah, you know, we, we take this Volpertinger hunt really seriously. And here's how it works. You know, when a kid gets to be about 13, 14 years old, um, all the hunters in the village will take them out into the woods on a moonlit night and they'll say, hey, it's time for you now to have your rite of passage. We all caught a Volpertinger when we were your age. Now it's your turn. We're going to give you an opportunity. And so they have this very ritualized hunt where they march this poor kid out into the woods in the middle of the night. And usually there are a lot of props involved, like here's your special Volpertinger burlap sack and here's your special stick. You can only use a stick made out of this kind of wood. So they have all this stuff. So they haul the kid out there and they put him in a field um, with the moon shining down and they say, okay, now you stay here with your stick and your bag. And we, the, the mature hunters in the community, we're all going to fan out into the woods and we're going to drive the Volpertinger toward you. So get ready. And then of course they all go back to the hunting lodge and just drink. And the whole gag is how long will it take before this kid who's standing out in this field by himself will make the connection uh, and say, okay, the joke's on me. We'll come back to the hunting lodge. But then the way this is always described to me is that that's the greatest moment when they come through the door of the lodge and everyone cheers and sings and drinks and hugs. And now that kid is going to be part of that community in a way that they never were before. So it actually is a real rite of passage. It is a community building tool, even though it's also a hoax. And, uh, you know, I just feel like people, when they hear the word hoax, often think of something that's malicious. And when I tell a story like that, I think it helps people to sort of see that hoaxes are built for pleasure, but they also have this very interesting often have this community building dynamic too. So that I agree with you that there's a dark side, but somehow that opens up into something that for me is quite beautiful. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. That's what <clears throat> goes on with, with uh, many kinds of practical jokes. So a snipe hunt, a, a haggis hunt, or a jackalope hunt is a, is a, is a variety of a, of a practical joke. Uh, and it's been suggested that the, the, those kinds of quote unquote hunts actually had the structure of an actual rite of passage. And it, oh. The initiate is separated from the group, I mean, physically, literally separated, left alone in the woods by themselves. Uh, he's not only alone, he's alone physically, but he's also alone in the ep ep epistemological sense in that he's the only one not in the know. Mm -hmm. But he's on the outs in every sense. And then he's gradually, uh, you know, comes to the realization uh, uh, either either before he arrives back home or perhaps on the only the time he does get back home. And then at the time of of uh, return, he is fully reincorporated into into the group, the family, whatever it is. Uh, and he's, as you said, he's he's a, a, a much bigger, uh, much more firmly within the group than even than he was before so in a way that 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 separation that period of darkness was a necessary prelude to the to the fully full initiation that's a wonderful way to put it yeah i had never thought of it quite that way but it does make sense that you know um rites of passage involve ritual they involve um being indoctrinated into a new understanding of something that you didn't understand before they involve separation and reintegration and, and, you know, these hunts for these various creatures, which resemble each other to a great degree. Um, and, and in Germany alone, you know, I had mentioned the Volpertinger, but one of the things I really explore in the book is about midway into the book, I kind of ask myself like, okay, and I'm a Westerner, I'm totally invested in the jackalope, but are there other things like this elsewhere? And it turns out there are precursors and analogs of the jackalope in cultures all around the world. And so I have a chapter called the global jackalope devoted to looking at all these jackalope cousins. But one of the things I found interesting was uh, no matter where in the world, this jackalope analog occurs, um, the engagement of the local community with it often involves around a mock hunt like this. And these are cultures who would not have been in contact with each other in any way. So there's something deeper going on there. And you know, I don't need to tell you that you're the folklorist, but working on this book, I really was charmed by this deeper understanding that, you know, as with the necessary monster, you know, jackalope 
um, cousins exist around the world because human beings need them to exist. The, the imagination of them does something for us that we can't um, that we can't access without them. Okay. Do you think that human beings need something to uh, uh, demarcate you know, us from them? I think that's part of it. I agree with that. I think that part of what charms us about the jackalope is that it's at once familiar and alien, as we were saying before. And, and certainly a lot of these monsters parole the boundaries between us and them, even if them is a completely hazy concept, even if, even if them only means not us, right? Um, so yeah, I do think that's that's part of it that they they help to patrol that boundary between the known and the unknown. You know, another way I like to think about it, and this comes from the fact maybe that I'm an environmental writer, um, but I also link an animal like the jackalope to the presence of actual wilderness. And the the mm -hmm. way I think the way I think about it is, you know, if your forest isn't deep enough, if your jungle isn't wild enough, if you're desert isn't broad enough to sustain the imagination of a monster, then it's harder for the monster to exist. So, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons the jackalope is a kind of endemic to the Intermountain West uh, is that we have these vast spaces where it seems like almost anything could be possible. And, you know, an animal that's as outrageous, for example, as the pronghorn antelope, speaking of, you know, hybridity, you know, the pronghorn isn't even an antelope. Antelope capra americana, it's the last surviving species of a whole range of Pleistocene um, antelope-like creatures that have been extinct for 15 million years. The, the pronghorn is by far the fastest land mammal in North America, and that's because it evolved to outrun American cheetahs, which have been extinct for 10,000 years. So that speed that's left over in the pronghorn is so fantastic. It's so otherworldly. It's so wild. Um, you know, the, the pronghorn, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to back into to saying it this way. If something as outrageous as a pronghorn can exist out there, then why not a jackalope? And I feel the same way about stuff that I don't believe in, like Sasquatch. I still think if we have temperate rainforests that are wild enough that we could imagine such a beast, that that's good for us as a species. It's not only good for habitat, good for wildness, good for all the animals that live in Sasquatch habitat, um, but it's good for us because if we so tame the world that it lacks the wildness necessary for us to sustain the imagination of one of these animals, then there's a kind of extinction that happens between our ears as well as out in the field. So I, I sometimes joke that you know, I'm going to get together with one of the environmental groups in Nevada and create a jackalope reserve out in central Nevada, because if we could set aside a piece of land big enough and wild enough, the jackalopes might live there. Then meanwhile, lots of other stuff will be able to live there as well, including our imagination of the possibility of a jackalope. So I, I really do like to think about, um, in my case, I've spent so much time thinking about the jackalope. I, I like to Think about the fact that protecting wild places helps to protect wild ideas and that people need wild ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of that, that, that reminds me of the news story that I heard um, a few years ago and I just put it in pre-COVID in early April some time ago about the uh, jackalopes being returned to Yellowstone. Yes, yeah, that's a, that's a great piece. And you know, the other thing about some of these jackalope pieces, they get revived every year. That's an, actually an old one. And every year they, they use it again. And what's great about it is that um, there are people in the National Park Service who are in on that joke and it gives it more credibility. And my favorite part about that, that jackalope reintroduction piece is how much science is used in that, in that little piece. I mean, it sounds so legit and they have an interview you know, with the local environmentalists who want to reintroduce jackalopes, but then they have an interview with some hunters and some ranchers, and they're worried that the jackalopes are going to, you know, hurt the, the pasturage for their stock. And it just looks like a standard environmental article in any Western newspaper. And that appropriation of scientific discourse for the purpose of this kind of humor, I've always been in love with. And, and, as you know, it's very old in American culture. I mean, you go back to Benjamin Franklin. Um, Franklin was writing these hoax pieces and the, they were being published in European newspapers. And the reason that they worked so well was that he knew how to use the language of science 
to sound like an expert. And, you know, he loved these things because Europeans were well healed and they condescended to us and they felt like they knew more than we did. And, you know, Franklin loved to pull the wool over their eyes. My, my favorite of these Franklin hoaxes, and there are lots of them, I mean, he's one of the first people to perfect this form in, in North America, uh, is when he writes this piece that's published in the London Daily Advertiser, like major newspaper in, in London, saying, oh yeah, you know, one of the most incredible things in the new world are these whales that, you know, will chase bait fish up the rivers for thousands of miles. And, you know, the really incredible part is when they start chasing them up waterfalls. And, you know, there's that great line where Franklin says, the grand leap of the whale up the falls of Niagara is the finest spectacle in nature. You know, never mind the fresh water. He's essentially saying these whales are jumping 180 feet up a waterfall. And, you know, people are falling for this stuff. But part of the reason they fell for it was anytime you can appropriate the language of expertise and science, right? For us, we hear something scientific. We think, oh, well, that guy sounds like they know what they're talking about. I don't know. Um, it, it, it's just a wonderful way to uh, test people's credulity. And, and so that same dynamic between Franklin and, and say folks in Paris or in London gets replayed when people in the American West start to make fun of people back East for, for being condescending and elite by producing stories like the Jackalope. So for example, when I interviewed uh, the mayor of Douglas, Wyoming about all this, he said, oh yeah, I go to these mayor's conferences in DC and I just hand out postcards of Jackalopes and I invite these guys to come Jackalope hunting with me. And I said, do they really fall for this? He said, it's DC. They don't know anything about Wyoming. And so he, he plays the rustic, like the rural bumpkin, and just reels all these people in and just has great fun doing it. So, you know, who's the smart one in that formula, right? And that's one of the dynamics that the jackalope exists to kind of negotiate. So I, I love that about hoaxes, that it always helps to kind of define the identity of insiders and outsiders. Well, we, we've talked about hoaxes quite a bit, but, you, but what you were saying there about, about the need for, for wild spaces, uh, what, uh, the, the, the need for them is a, a, in our imaginations, everything else, um, brings to my mind the lovely parts of your book that treat the tall tale, which is uh, not, not unique to, uh, in, to America, but it is frequently associated with any kind of culture that has a, a frontier. So Australia, Israel are also known for tall tales, but many, many, many Americans, Stephen, some American folklorists would claim the tall tale as a uh, characteristically American genre of folklore. Yeah, I mean, I love the tall tale. I'm a storyteller and a humorist myself, so it's it's too delicious to pass up. But I think you're right that the tall tale has often been associated with frontier cultures, in part, again, because the of the perception that things that are bigger and wilder than you could ever possibly imagine actually exist here. So the tall tale that I offer in my book is about the Great Basin Desert, which is my home desert. This is an incredible place. So I can tell you, you know, 20 things about it that you'd say that can't be true, that actually are true. And once I get you to believe that, then I could tell you a few things that, that are not true. And that's my way of uh, sort of saying, hey, I love this landscape. I understand it. And people who are in on the joke will really enjoy this. If you're not in on it yet, you, you soon will be. So I see that we're about almost 45 minutes in, mm -hmm. and uh, before we segue to taking some questions, and I think that our, our buddies at Nevada Humanities were going to kind of filter the chat and maybe present us with some questions, but I did want to at least mention, I knew that our conversation would really focus on the folklore aspects, which has been super fun for me. I don't get to have this kind of talk about the book very often, so this is a real treat. You're sort of my ideal reader, Moira, in a lot of ways. I also wanted to mention to folks out there um, that one of the real pivots in the book is that horned rabbits do exist in nature. So after making this case about all the stories we tell about this imagined imaginary animal, the jackalope, I go on to explain that um, there is a particular kind of papillomavirus that strikes rabbits in the wild and causes them to have these very strange growths on their head. And that in effect, these real jackalopes do exist in the world. And so the last third of the book is sort of popular science writing where 
I look at what causes these growths, how have people understood and studied them in the past, and to leave out a lot of nerdy stuff that you'll enjoy in the book, um, if you connect the dots, it was the study of horned rabbits that led to the development of the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is saving millions of lives every year. So um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of obsessive when I take anything on. And so I try to look at the jackalope from every possible angle. So I look at humor, I look at folklore, I look at kitsch, I look at art, but I also, and at these global analogs, but I also look at this amazing science history story of how the safest, most effective anti-cancer vaccine that we've ever created literally would not exist without real life jackalopes. And that was a really exciting part of the story to be able to tell. So if it sounds okay to you, Moira, maybe we'll invite, let's invite our, whoever's, I guess, I guess Kathleen has popped back in and uh, maybe she can help us see what's been going on in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Mike and Moira. What an enchanting conversation about jackalopes. I, I wish more and more that I, I was in a club and that I had one too in my office, but someday, someday I'll, I'll get there. Um, I'll start out with a, a citing narrative that someone provided in chat before moving on to our, our first question. So it's just um, a fun, fun bit of info for you all. Um, Katrina shared, jackalopes are a bonding topic in our family. We were on a road trip and my oldest sister, 12 at the time, had picked up a book that mentioned jackalopes and she was telling us jackalope facts and my parents told her they weren't real. We were all completely devastated. Then we stopped at a rest stop and there was a taxidermy jackalope. We were all convinced my parents were wrong. And from then on, jackalopes, jackalopes are something our family loves. So thank you for sharing that. That is, I, I, I love that for so many reasons. I mean, first of all, the use of the term bonding topic, Katrina, that's really cool because that's essentially uh, what Moira and I have been talking about, the way something like this can really bring people together. But I also love the way your narrative gives us a vacillation between is it real? Is it not real? So you read some jackalope facts, it's real. Your folks tell you it isn't, it isn't. You see a taxidermy mount, it is again. And that's that modulation we're talking about where creatures like this kind of go back and forth between the world of the real and the imaginary and they kind of take us with them. And part of what's been so fun about this book are all the people who've shared their own family's jackalope stories with me. So thank you very much for that. So our first question comes from Dane, who is a reference librarian in Louisiana. So thank you, Dane, for joining us to get, uh, today. Uh, he wonders, have either of you thought about capitalism as a reason or cause for jackalopes and other similar creations? For example, uh, taxidermy jackalopes and the t-shirts, bumper stickers, et cetera, can be quite expensive. So he's curious about capitalism and the connection to jackalopes. Yeah, I'll jump in. I have an answer to that. And then, and then Moira, if you have other thoughts, please uh, join us. It is true that the jackalope crap industry is worth a ton of money. So you're absolutely right. I mean, a jackalope taxidermy mount is going to run you, you know, 120, 150 bucks. And as you say, t-shirts, whiskeys, you know, there, there's no end to this stuff. So, so yes, I do agree. There's no question that this is an industry. Uh, that, that the jackalope has become an industry. Now, the difference though, that, that I find important is take for example, um, other ideas that are widely disseminated in the culture or other characters that are disseminated in the culture. So for example, a Disney character. Okay, so a Disney character has armies of um, intellectual property lawyers whose job is to protect that brand. And I mean, you can't so much as paint a Disney princess on the wooden fence in front of your, you know, preschool without getting sued. They will be on you instantly. They control that brand and they milk it for all it's worth. The jackalope is owned by no one. And that is part of what makes it enchanting and unique as far as I'm concerned. It, when we talk about the folk process, that something is disseminated through folk culture, that has to be something that somebody else doesn't own. So, you know, why are there over 100 jackalope songs? Why are there films with jackalopes, jackalope visual art? Because nobody owns it. And so, yes, I agree that a lot of money is generated uh, through sales of jackalope iconography in, in many different media. But to me, what's still special and different about it is 
If you want to write a jackalope song or paint a jackalope painting or tell a jackalope story, you can go home and do it tonight with nobody's permission. And I've talked to the descendants of, you know, the those teenagers who made those first jackalope mounts, and that's part of what they're really proud of. They, the, the term they always use in the, in the Herrick family, they say they gave something to the world. And I think, you know, gave is the operative word here. So, so yes and no. I, I hope my answer is helpful, but that's a really smart question, Dane, and thank you for being with us. Yeah, and I, I would I absolutely underline that, that, uh, that this is but this is what makes jackalopes and, and all the creatures like them um, folk folk culture um, um, because folk culture is 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 not owned by anybody. Although there are attempts from time to time to people try to make to to corral them and and take them out of the common uh, common property and make them intellectual property of individuals. Um, I think I do think though that capitalism uh, capitalism doesn't cause these kinds of creatures, but it does amplify them. It helps it helps the spread, uh, and uh, so I don't see a I don't see a, a disjunction between those two things. It's more kind of symbiosis. Great. We have a, a burning question, in the audience, um, about jackalope antler sheds. So, Mike and Laura, <laughs> do people find jackalope antler sheds or other kinds of physical evidence to justify their encounters? Yes. Well, of course. I mean, this is a brilliant question. Um, let, let's back up a little bit. The jackalope, as you know, is uh, hybridized between a jackrabbit and a pronghorn antelope. And pronghorn, because they're not related to regular antelope, they actually shed their antler core. Most animals that have horns don't shed them. Animals that have antlers do shed them. It's almost a definitional difference between the two, but pronghorn actually do shed their antlers. Now, jackalopes also shed their antlers and their antler shed is very rare and difficult to find. And one of the reasons is that the jackalope is the only animal in North America that sheds only one antler at a time. And the reason for that is the jackalopes back into their dens in order to keep their antlers in front of them to protect themselves. So jackalopes back into their dens. And if they had a dual antler shed, like most ungulates in North America, then they would be vulnerable during that period. So instead they will shed a single antler, keep the other antler to defend themselves. And then um, they will grow the second antler and then shed the first one. So, you know, you can see from an evolutionary point of view, it's a brilliant strategy for self-defense. So yes, and if you find antler sheds on public lands, technically you're not allowed to, uh, you know, make chandeliers out of them, um, but you know, that's up to you. So that, that's the kind of quick biological answer on, on jackalope antler shed, but great question. Thank so you. Is it Mike, that you can tell the age of a jackalope by the length of its antlers? The length of its antlers, um, how branching the antlers are. And then if you actually, you know, you can do like a, the way dendrochronologists will take core samples of trees and, you know, use the rings. There is a kind of um, tissue buildup over the years. So if you core sample or, you know, uh, cut a jackalope antler, you can determine its age that way also. You can't always go by size. There's some sexual dimorphism between the, the males and the females. Um, and depending on the richness of the nutrients in their habitat, they grow faster or slower. So actually that's one of the best ways to tell the, the age of a jackalope. Because if you ask them, they lie. Well, yeah, you can't <laughs> trust them. Oh, well, that's one, that's one thing we haven't talked about actually, Moira, is um, you know, there, there are many folk tales told about jackalopes, um, uh, and I could share those with you, but among the most famous, of course, is that jackalopes have the power of ventriloquism. They can actually sing, and cowboys have told these stories since the 19th century, but also campers, backpackers. If you're, if you're in the West and you're around the campfire and you sing, you'll often hear the jackalope harmonizing with you from afar. Uh, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. So, for example, you'll often hear, oh, yeah, I hear, you know, the jackalope can sing along with people and it harmonizes and it sings the bass part. Well, that's not true. They always sing the treble part. But but yeah, they do have the power to uh, uh, to harmonize. They don't very often speak, although they will do that to throw hunters off the track. Um, so, for example, they'll say, you know, there he goes over there. And you know to throw the hunter off the track. So, and you know, not a lot of North American um, animals can speak English in that way. So, 
um, you know, it is a little bit different. We have two real jackalope experts here, so I'm just pleased that we're sharing these facts with the world. Um, we'll end with uh, one more question um, about hoaxes. Um, and before that, I'll just share um, separately. Someone said, in a world full of hoaxes that can feel kind of sinister these days, I love the joy that hoaxes like this, the jackalope can bring. So thank you, Stephanie, for, for sharing that. Um, I know that this was covered a little bit earlier um, during your conversation, but someone was just wondering a little bit more if you could talk about um, whether or not scientific hoaxes might lead to, you know, more of a, a distrust of science in spite of how clever they might be, such as conspiracy theories. Um, and I just think it's interesting when you talk about scientific hoaxes in this fact, especially because your book, you know, connects uh, jackalopes and, um, and cancer. So um, if you could speak more about scientific hoaxes and science, that would be great. Yeah, Moira, but before I take that on in a jackalope context, do you want to try that one from the larger context of the folklorist? Well, that's, that's, it's a, I think maybe that question came from a folklorist. Um, it's into, it's a, it's a difficult question because uh, when it comes to uh, a lot of the, the comic hoaxes that we talked about, practical jokes, they, they tend to assume a shared body of knowledge that everyone can more or less agree on. And even though there are some people out there who are not in on that knowledge, there's differential knowledge, but it ends ideally with everyone on the same page. Um, uh, if you don't have that shared body of knowledge or that shared set of assumptions, then everything falls apart pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really helpful answer that, you know, what makes a hoax pleasurable um, is contingent on an understanding of the hoax that ultimately uh, builds community. If people are left on the outside of that sense of community for any reason, including, let's say, not having the same level of scientific literacy as people who are inside the community, whatever community that is, then I do think it can turn dark. One of the reasons I'm attracted to the jackalope um, is uh, because it it has that feeling, as Stephanie was saying in the earlier comment that was shared, that it has that feeling of not being insidious, of not being manipulative or dark or exploitative, that ultimately it brings humor, it brings pleasure, it is community building. And, and I'm a popular science writer also. So, you know, as you'll see from the last third of this book, I mean, I done an incredible amount of research to try to get my science exactly right. So I take this very, very seriously. So yeah, I would say that the caveat to all of this, as Moira suggests, is that a scientific hoax is one that is designed to, uh, to ultimately expand scientific literacy by bringing people into a sense of community. Um, and, and, that's not a perfect answer, and I do think there are risks, and I'm glad that Moira is so articulate about what they are, but, but my own sense of the spirit of this is that we don't want to leave anybody behind. Well, thank you so much, Meg and Moira, for taking some time out of, you know, your busy schedules to speak with us all today about jackalopes and humor and folklore. Um, I also wanted to give an especial thanks to Boris and Paxton. I know that, you know, they're probably catching up on their beauty sleep or yes. they have very busy, busy schedules. Um, so thank you so much, Boris and Paxton, for joining us. It's really, I think this is a, a special treat that we don't often get to see, you know, these mm -hmm. two beautiful specimens, you know, <laughs> in front of us. So uh, for everyone else, if you would like to learn more about Nevada Humanities programming and stay updated with our schedule events, you can sign up for an email newsletter. You can check out our calendar at nevadahumanities.org. Um, we always appreciate hearing from our audience members about these events. So if you had any lingering questions we didn't get to today, you can email us, info at nevadahumanities.org, or you can send an email to Mike and Moira. Um, I know that they would also love to hear from you if you have questions about jackalope, folklore, humor, everything else in between and outside. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, I think we're going to be very well represented at the National Book Festival. So I can't wait to spread the word of the Jack Better booth, Mike, and see how <laughs> see how people react. So yeah. I'm, I'm very excited. We're going to have a lot of fun. And thanks so much, Moira, for your time. And thanks, as always, to Nevada Humanities for their great work. And those of you who are in northern Nevada, we hope to see you out on September 10th for Nevada Humanities Literary Crawl. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.